Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever in the world you may be joining us from today. My name is Francesco Del Carpio, and I am the CFL York Operations Coordinator. I would like to officially open the second session of the Sustainable Economic Growth and Prosperity Speaker Series. I will begin today with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge and recognize that many Indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territory upon which our campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. The area is known as Tokoronto and has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Native communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and that the territory is subject to the District 1 Spoon Welcome Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. As this is an online event, our participants may be joining from various locations, so I strongly encourage you to learn about the traditional land upon which you are located. With this, I welcome our moderator, our speaker, and our participants from around the world. Welcome to our webinar. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Alia Abbas. Alia Abbas is an award-winning economic development professional with over eight years of experience in the field. She is the recent winner of the International Top 40 Under 40 Award for Economic Developers. She was selected for the 2023 award for her work in advocacy and economic development. She was invited to Tucson, Arizona, where she was granted this award by the CEO of the International Economic Development Council, or IEDC, Nathan Oler, and CEO Julie Curtin of Development Consultants International. Aliyah is this, also the CEO and founder of Aliyah Consulting, economic development firm based in Toronto. Her firm focuses on business continuity and economic recovery initiatives. She worked as the investment attraction consultant for USA East for Toronto Global. She worked with Toronto Global to develop the new supply chain onshoring resilience and expansion program or SCORE program. She is also an active member of both the International Economic Development Council and the Economic Developers Council of Ontario. Aliyah, thank you very much for being with us today and moderating this session. The floor is yours. Yes. Hi, everyone. It's great to have you all here today. And we have a really exciting session planned. I am so honored to introduce to you guys today's speaker. Dana Abu Chakra is a business innovation program manager, product manager, entrepreneur educator, business consultant, and digital marketer. She's passionate about innovation in a way that transcends work to help businesses unlock their full potential and succeed in the marketplace. She has worked with diverse organizations, compromising of academic institutions, government, private sector, nonprofits, and NGOs, including Toronto Metropolitan University, DMZ, American University of Beirut, Lebanese American University, NDU, Rural Entrepreneurs, UNICEF, Conrad Adenor, uh, Stiftung, uh, Stiftung, um, it's German. Yeah. So I don't speak German. So sorry about that. Um, and then USAID and then Ber Berry Tech, Global Entrepreneurship Network, Halt Prize and Park Innovation. Dana's experience working in Canada and abroad has given her insights on international businesses and the global impact of innovation. She believes that we all need to play a role in leveraging innovation for societal, societal livelihood, economic prosperity and environmental sustainability. So no further ado. Um, I'm going to open the floor to Dana, but just to let everyone know, if you have any questions, please use the chat box or raise your hand. And at the end of the session, we will unmute you and you can ask away. So Dana, take it away. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful intro. Um, really excited to talk about a topic that I'm very passionate about and to combine it with a topic that we should all be passionate about, which is um, impact and sustainability. So today we are covering the entrepreneurial strategy for more community livelihood and economic prosperity of, of our country and, and the world. Here's a quick agenda. I'm gonna do a quick overview. Um, so this talk is part of a series of talk um, on economic development. Um, for for economic for economic prosperity and um, community as well, and it's tying in the SDGs because we know that they're going to play a key part of that prosperity in our long term goals. Um, so I'm going to cover what was uh, spoken about in the first series, which was hosted by my colleague Leah here, 
uh, looking at what is economic development, you know, the definition of it for um, the series and sustainable development as well. And then how do we define entrepreneurship? Uh, we'll talk a bit about community, a key uh, pillar of uh, successful entrepreneurial um, systems. And then also we'll talk about impact business tying in the SDGs. But first, um, I want to know, what do you want to know? So if you can uh, quickly post in the chat, uh, just a couple of keywords to help me understand, what do you want to get out of this session, first and foremost? Give that a couple of seconds. See some interaction. What would you like to know? Okay, maybe I'll lean on my colleagues here. Um, Aaliyah, what do you want to know about entrepreneurship and our economy? Yeah, so I would love to know more about um, what is the future for entrepreneurs um, in this space? Um, what are some of the trends that you're seeing? Um, and I think the idea of just entrepreneurs is just like, you know, um, people that want to open up their own business and they're just exploring. So I feel hopefully this audience is kind of exploring to become a future entrepreneur. Who knows? Um, that's where you're joining the call today. But um, I think it's more around just understanding where where is this field going? What what to expect as a new business owner or a potential owner of a business? And yeah. Thank you. So I think you you covered everything there. Mm -hmm. um, and that is what we are talking about today. So we are looking at, at entrepreneurship and we are looking at sustainability and we are combining them for economic development. Um, and, and what economic development is defined as here uh, is the process by which um, our economic well-being and quality of life as a country or even as a city or local community are made better. So if we want to break that down, this can look like um, targeted efforts to create more jobs through business retention, uh, expansion, or in the case of entrepreneurship, creation. And also, um, how can we attract, attract um, international investing into our space? Uh, it could look like workforce development and creating and supporting the growth of jobs in a community, um, and also community development. So. Um, how we support local residents um, in ensuring they're maintaining their quality of life and livelihood. And the additional piece that we are including here is sustainability. So how can we do all of this in a way where we don't compromise our natural resources, um, our natural environment, or um, our, our societal well-being? And economic development can go into detail, can go into detail across different verticals. But for the case of this uh, program, we're only looking at it um, in a very general, general sense. Sustainable development complements economic development in a way that seeks to create balance between the three pillars of sustainability. This is protecting the environment, protecting our economy, and also creating um, societal inclusion and well-being. And it's interesting because traditionally these three things have competed have competed because of certain limitations. So for our economy to prosper, uh, there is a major cost to our environment. Um, and uh, for our environment to prosper, there is a cost to how we nurture different communities, but it doesn't have to be this way. We can think about new systems, new ways in which all three can live in a harmony. And, and that is how we ensure long-term growth. And so, in 2015, a bunch of countries got together and said, okay, with this trajectory, like we're not going very far. We need to set some new goals. And they decided to set goals for 2030. And these goals boiled down to 17 priorities. And these priorities are in front of us right now. They are the sustainable development goals. Um, all countries around the world signed in uh, to be a part of these goals and to somehow include them in, um, all their, all their uh, planning and forecasting. We won't go into the goals in detail, but I do recommend that you go on and read a little bit about why these are priority. What are the problems behind them? 
and uh, how each countries are contributing to them. And very interestingly, these goals can uh, be split into the three pillars of sustainability, environment, society, and economy. And we see that society has kind of the greatest amount of, of cubes and goals here. It's because we rely on society to be nurturing environment and economy on the flip side. Um, and so it's interesting when we see the dynamic um, of the, the pillars come into play with the goals. And very interestingly, I wanted to share this really quick. There is also an open data charter supporting the SDGs. And what this means is that um, governments uh, provide open data on, on their websites and online to say that we are going to share our progress. And not just that, we're going to share our learning from what is happening with our um, SDG pursuits. And so there's tons of learning and feedback online about how this SDG progress is going in which countries can use. And what's interesting is there, even though, I mean, we look at Canada and we think, oh, we're in a much better position than um, maybe a country elsewhere. But if you think about goal setting, right? If you, let's talk about poverty. I mean, if you have um, a 90% no poverty rate, that's a 10% poverty rate. That means out of, um, uh, you know, 100 people, 10 people, are living in poverty, that is 10 too much. And so the idea of the SDGs is to say the, the benchmark is 110%. We need to be ready to nurture uh, you, you know, new populations to come, growing populations, if that's the case. And we need to work together to share the best practices and how we're doing this. And one country might be good at you know, reaching the no poverty goal while another country might be better in some form of environmental sustainability. And so by working together and understanding these best practices, um, we create a global cooperation on sustainability so that we can reach 100% um, uh, rates, 110% rates on all of these goals. Now, the definition for uh, entrepreneurship, well, I would say in some way or another, um, it is relative. Uh, many people have defined entrepreneurship differently. I actually, my, my university degree is on entrepreneurship um, and innovation strategy. And so I like to keep entrepreneurship an open definition. But if I had to give one definition to it, and it's also an evolving definition, but if I was to give one definition to it, um, I would say it is the process of discovering new ways um, by combining resources and assuming risk for the creation of a business or an organization. And even as we understand the goals of business and organizations, um, the, the, the definition of entrepreneurship evolves. So for example, traditionally the, the role of a business was to maximize shareholder wealth. Um, but now as we see again, the trajectory of our world, well, we're thinking, well, how can we also maximize our environmental wealth, our environmental benefits? Um, how can we create um, more, more social wealth, social inclusion, social diversity, um, finding all the benefits of that? And so uh, the most important part of entrepreneurship is the entrepreneur. Um, it's that person behind it, that human resource that is the agent of change and is always seeking those new ways and um, evolving the way we do things. And it I would say this quote is, is one of the, you know, it's at the heart of entrepreneurship. One of the, the key defining methods in which entrepreneurs think is that we don't always have to do it the same way we've, we've always done it. And this is Grace Hopper. She is um, a pioneer in computer uh, science and also um, a member of the US Army. Uh, before her time, uh, she always thought about new ways of doing things at a young age. She, uh, she had a clock that she programmed to go backwards. Um, saying that, you know, we can look at things in, in, in new ways. And I think it's become even more paramount to do that moving forward. And this is one of my all-time favorite charts when I talk about entrepreneurship. Um, and it looks at the history of innovation cycles. Um, it's about a 250-year showcase of, you know, the first wave of innovation. And it, it was a cotton factory. And so at that point, um, we began producing things and selling them at mass. And we look at the second wave, that is when we had railroads and they're therefore creating productivity in our supply chain. 
uh, the third wave, we saw a processing line from um, you know, the Henry Ford line of, of vehicles. And if you notice something very interesting, these waves get smaller and smaller as time progresses. And this is a pattern that continues. Um, it looks at how knowledge grows exponentially. And so uh, future entrepreneurs, future agents of change are learning from previous ones and therefore able to accelerate um, changes. And uh, we are here, we are at the sixth wave right now. And a wave will generally create systematic changes. And that's what we're seeing. That is what AI um, and a lot of other technologies right now are creating systematic changes in our environments and in our economies. And these are driven um, by um, entrepreneurs um, and groups of entrepreneurs. And we're, we're gonna talk about how. So the first strategic outcome we see from the entrepreneurial strategy is societal shifts towards innovation from these agents of change, um, pushing towards new ways of doing things. I'm going to use this structure throughout the presentation. So after we cover a topic, I'm going to talk about the strategic outcome um, of the entrepreneurial strategy. So in talking about innovation, um, innovation, uh, specifically via businesses, organizations, or startups, which are new businesses, um, what they do is they create new products and services. And to do this, you require new talent. So that is the first thing entrepreneurs do. They bring talent together. They bring groups of human uh, resources, talented human resources together. And by doing this, they attract new money, new investment. And another amazing outcome is it forces mature businesses to do a better job. And what happens when mature businesses get too comfortable are monopolies, for example. Um, so, you know, entrepreneurs come in and say, no, we got a better way of doing this. And, and naturally other businesses will say, oh, there is something on the horizon. Um, we need to maintain this race. Uh, and so if we go back to strategic outcomes, um, now there has been greater job creation. Uh, there has been an embrace of diversity and inclusion in, in this new group of talent that's coming together. We have increased competition um, and therefore may, may, you know, the most fittest survive. And we've also attracted investment, whether it's local or international, um, giving way for um, more economic opportunity. Now, when we look at this entrepreneur, this agent of change, how can we, um, how can we highlight what makes them entrepreneurial? What makes them unique? Well, one thing that we find with all entrepreneurs is they have tolerance for ambiguity. So ambiguity is another word for kind of uncertainty and really understanding uncertainty is what helps us understand emerging markets and, or what, what markets are to shape the future, are to fulfill our needs um, as, as communities and societies. And so tol uh, entrepreneurs have a high tolerance for this uncertainty. They tend to go into it with this curiosity, this desire, this, this want, wanting to know, this thirst for knowledge. And they do it with a growth mindset. A growth mindset simply means that any failure, that means they fail with grace. So any failure uh, in which they encounter, they just say, that is feedback from the world. I'm going to take that feedback and become even stronger from it, moving in um, to kind of a new paradigm of, of knowledge. And they also possess self-belief, the self-confidence that um, their vision deserves to happen and can happen. And uh, grit has been another word that kind of defines all of these together, a very powerful word that has been researched more, most recently um, by a researcher named Angela Duckworth. And it brings together this resilience and perseverance uh, in which entrepreneurs uh, tend to possess. And so the ability to you know, say, I get stronger um, each time I'm knocked down, I get stronger with each failure, I get stronger uh, with each um, risk assumed. And grit can even be broken down. So that's very interesting. So I wanted to share it can be broken down into four pillars. It starts with, you know, an interest, something we all possess. We have interest in passion and to certain subjects. Um, but then it evolves into practice um, and almost this, this obsessive practice. 
whether it's you know practice in, in problem solving or uh, practice in, in learning or practice in selling, right? They kind of obsess about what it is that they're passionate about. And they usually have a purpose that's far greater than themselves. And they always possess that hope, that self-belief that you know this could become real. Now, if we look at Canada, um, you know, a recent article shows uh, Canada has fewer entrepreneurs today than it did 20 years ago. Um, we're also seeing entrepreneurs uh, moving to the states. It's a big problem. And when we look at that, we know um, part of part of that reason. Well, for one, we know uh, Canada traditionally has been naturally risk risk averse, you could say. Um, you know, we, we, we tread with care. And this is having you know a, a culture that nourishes risk um a culture a safe place to fail is is very important for entrepreneurs and so uh bdc business development canada said one of the things that um is is important here is creating more skills training uh, covering those elements that we talked about about entrepreneurial traits and nourishing them um in in people whether early on or or in immigrants that are coming into the country and, and want to start something and have new ways of thinking um for for our communities and so another thing entrepreneurship does is, is strategic outcome is fostering good talent just by way of uh, having entrepreneurs as leaders or by seeing the value entrepreneurship for our economy, uh, we are creating key skills training that go into fostering economic prosperity and, and also even, um, you know, environmental protection and social inclusion and all of that. Now, I want to jump into a very important element of um, entrepreneurship and, and successful entrepreneurial systems, and that is community. And so if we look here, um, this, this is from a book called The Startup Community Way, which I'll talk about in a second. But if we look at how our communities are sort of set up, we have you know, our overall society, and then within it, we have our economy. And within that, we have innovation ecosystems. Um, now we are in a knowledge economy. Right, where we have evolved from an industrial economy. So our greatest asset is the knowledge that's exchanged um, between us. And that represents the innovation ecosystem. Um, what communities are nurturing this knowledge exchange, which is our greatest asset, which facilitates the, the most amount of work. And then within those communities, we see entrepreneurial ecosystems. Um, so kind of just like science, when you bring a lot of molecules together, a reaction is bound to happen. And that's how entrepreneurial ecosystems function. Uh, when we bring communities of entrepreneurs together, uh, reactions happen. And these reactions um, are all outcomes for, for our economy and our environment and our society. And then um, deeper within, we also have startup communities. What's interesting about startup communities is that they're at the forefront of innovation. So they are the ones that are leading these innovation waves from one wave to another. They are the ones that are leveraging um, the most cutting edge research to say, okay, uh, how, how can we take the greatest risks? How can we enter the most unknown zones and create change um, and see how, how these uh, changes will be adopted? Um, by by our communities and so brad feld um, and ian hathaway both investors they're from the states they wrote a book on how you nurture these communities and i just want to share this with you because i think it's very important in um in 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 our world uh, to be a part of these communities no matter what industry you come from and to uh, understand where they exist. And we see a lot more startup um, or tech meetups. We see a lot more um, uh, tech events happening, uh, conferences, because they are aware of how critical this, within the greater ecosystems, they are aware of how critical this knowledge exchange is. So there's never a shortage of these events. And, and now you can attend them too um, and understand where they're their value exists. So what Brad was able to observe is that these communities, these entrepreneurial startup communities are complex systems, much like a rainforest. And their primary purpose is to help startups succeed. 
And they're led from the bottom up, which means that entrepreneurs lead the way. They are the visionaries that understand where um, these uh, communities should be headed and in turn um, where our economic prosperity could lay. And it is really about the health of the interactions in these communities. It's about that exchange that occurs. It's not the individual parts. So this goes to the famous quote, you know, um, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that's really what uh, is at the heart of, of successful startup communities. And communities must be inclusive. Actually, the more diverse they are, the more successful they are because we're bringing new systems, new ways of thinking. And they can't be replicated. So I remember during the early days of the startup, building a start, startup communities here in Canada, you know, we would all often reference Silicon Valley, which is the, uh, the hub of it all. I mean, they've done it so successfully. And by trying to replicate them or using them as benchmark, we, we lose touch with all the things that we do very well or the interactions that make us unique. So it's important that you understand within your greater ecosystems, what makes you unique and to foster that within um, the, the, your startup communities. So understanding how interactions are more feasible and are, are greater facilitated in your unique community and uh, not necessarily just replicating another model because it's, it's not uh, just a formula. And then it's important to have continual activities. These are key to engaging the entire entrepreneurial stack. And again, that's why I mentioned we see so many um, events and meetups uh, within, within startup and tech communities. And what is the entrepreneurial stack? Well, you can see it here to the right. The entrepreneurial stack includes government. It includes banks. It includes research and development bodies. It includes universities, corporations, and uh, many more consultants, contractors. Um, it's, it's really everybody being involved in these interactions to create um, more, more uh, knowledge and uh, more reactions. And that's it. It's bringing together people and innovation to solve big problems and creating community and collisions, um, looking at it as a team sport you know, the interactions create dependencies and in these dependencies, we have richer, um, more informed um, uh, exchanges. And then there's also leadership and growth. It's uh, people not being afraid to take the next step towards growth, the next step towards scale, right? Um, knowing that there is this community um, which, which becomes a, a backbone. Um, to, to whatever risks they're taking, or whatever pursuits they're taking in their business. It is a productive, productive force for our economy, the, these forms of communities. And we can see that um, in this chart that look, looks at what capital is formed. So um, again, this is from the Startup Community Way and we can see cultural capital Right, so now we are nurturing society. We can see cultural capital happening in the greater circle and then within it, we see human capital being fostered, financial capital being fostered and attracted, right? Um, and network capital, this is a very important one. How are exchanges happening? How is the supply um, of knowledge happening within um, these intricate complex networks within the community? And so we can add to our strategic outcomes from community that entrepreneurship creates, um, uh, sorry, we can add to the strategic outcomes um, within community. Uh, entrepreneurship adds networks. It creates knowledge exchange, greater knowledge exchange and, and fosters culture. Um, culture is a key element of all societal well-being and livelihood. And it even reinforces um, investment uh, and attracting investment and also um, reinforces uh, the fostering of, of good talent. Now, there's all sorts of environmental factors um, that are really pulling entrepreneurs um, left and right. 
And if you're an employee, you know, you really can pick, you pick and choose which factors you're focusing on. But when you're an entrepreneur, all of these factors are impacting, are impacting you. And you have to keep an eye on, you know, political direction and media direction and how um, this might be impacting your own business. You have to look at uh, climate change. You have to look at um, all types of forces uh, like com competition um, and you know economy, policy, interest rates, what's driving your rent up and down. So it is, it is really a lot. And then you on the flip side, you're also looking at internal factors um, such as you know the culture of your organization and the greater culture in which you have those networks to support your organization, uh, the development of your human resources, and so on and so forth. So they are really tracking all of the factors um, that go into uh, uh, driving our overall well-being and our livelihood. And so now I want to bring in how impact entrepreneurship can play a greater role in entrepreneurship. So we look at the three elements of sustainability again, okay? We look at um, economy, um, environment, and society. And when there are two working together, we get to fair, viable, and, and manageable um, status quos. But in the heart of it, when all three of them are working together, then we get to sustainable development. And because entrepreneurs are constantly tracking all of these factors, they can bring in um, the, these three pillars to a point of sustainability. And that is defined as impact entrepreneurship. Um, so uh, again, can be related back to the SDGs, setting the priorities within each pillar and if we want to define entrepreneurship, uh, impact entrepreneurship, which another key term you'll hear a lot of is social entrepreneurship. It's an effort to create, develop, and sustain new business models or new organizational models in response to environmental changes. And um, it's pursuing uh, goals that have social and environmental impact as well as financial success. And oftentimes, this social and environmental impact is equal with financial success. So it's not to say that it's just, um, you know, a form of uh, charitable cause or a form of giving. The bottom line of your um, profits is just as important as what type of benefit are we giving to societies? What type of benefit are we creating for the environment? or at least how are we minimizing costs to a bare minimum for our environment and, and for our societies? But even better, how are we creating benefits? And very interestingly, um, I remember one time asking an impact investor. So this is a investor who looks for entrepreneurs who, who have businesses with social and environmental bottom lines. And I said, as a social entrepreneur, or an impact entrepreneur, should I aim to create a billion dollar business? Like, can that be sustainable? And I was very shocked by his response. He said, absolutely, you should aim to be a billion dollar entrepreneur. You deserve to be a billion dollar entrepreneur if you're the one who's also thinking about um, you know, social justice and, and environmental protection. And so it's to say that he has witnessed models that can actually um, create balance among all three of the sustainable development pillars, right? So um, we need more people with the courage to say, I can think about a profitable model that's also profitable for our planet. And I'm gonna do that at a scale that no one's seen before. And we can in in imagine a more conscious, um, uh, business ecosystem um, and you know what it's not just the entrepreneur that wants this it's the customers 
statistics show there is a rise of conscious consumers. I mean, all the numbers are at a tipping point to say, you know, companies need to put more emphasis on environment and sustainability or they're going to lose their customers. Customers are willing to pay higher prices when they know that this is a, a part of the um, company's values. And many people are taking action right now with companies where they see um, unethical practices. The entrepreneur from all types of agents of change and from all forms of decision makers, they are the most concerned with the trustful and happy exchange of the customer. And they're also the most knowledgeable about this happy exchange and how it can occur. They're, they're constantly gaining feedback from the market and uh, picking themselves up and dusting themselves off when they've made a mistake to improve the, um, the status quo of their business, right? So ultimately they are in the best position to create practical solutions for our global problems. So if I wanna compare it, and I guess I am, um, bias, but if I want to compare it, if you have government enacting um, certain uh, practices for recycling, that's great. And people will be forced to do it so that they don't pay a fine. But if you have an entrepreneur coming in and saying, you know what, I have a really cool idea for how people can do composting in their backyards and it doesn't, it's not smelly and it doesn't create a lot of heat. Um, and so all of a sudden we have large number of people um, composting uh, because it's easy and because it's fun all of a sudden, it's not no longer imposed, then you're gonna have a greater adoption of that, uh, uh, that solution. Um, and it will be less costly on our governments and it'll be more beneficial for our, our uh, communities and for the environment overall. So that's just one example. There, there's so many other ones as well. Um, for example, uh, you know, food banks, um, which are often um, subsidized by government, are great and wonderful. Um, but oftentimes, they uh, they don't protect the dignity of of the person entering the food bank. It can be hard on them to say, okay, well, you know, and I can't afford food this month, so I got to go to a food bank. Um, so I've seen business models where uh, there have been uh, companies that have just created really discounted, discounted costs. And um, what they do is they actually create a food bank that looks exactly like a supermarket. Um, it's not called a food bank even. And so the shopper can go in with in a dignified manner and say, hey, I'm just picking up fruit like anyone else is in the grocery store. I'm not going to a food bank and getting a bo box. And even the quality of the food you know, it's high quality, it's not processed foods or cheap foods, which then in turn creates a lot of other um, health complications um, in that, you know, marginalized community. And social, so social entrepreneurship, in essence, um, in the wise words of Mr. Einstein, is simply saying, like, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. And the entrepreneurs, they're, they're the rule breakers, right? They're the ones that are not afraid of going into uncertainty and saying, hey, even if this doesn't work, I'm willing to try it and to take all the risks and to fail and then just pick myself up and brush myself off. And so um, they really possess the power um, to incorporate these SDGs in um, new business models, creating new ways of thinking. And speaking of food banks, just yesterday, um, you know, that this was, uh, this was on TV. So I quickly snapped a picture of it and it's, you know, food bank um, associates, you know, sounding the alarm that we are at an unprecedented time in history in Canadian food banks. Um, number of people are coming in are too great for us to handle and something needs to be done. And at the heart of this is, you know, our economic um, policies, our economic actions, and um, at the heart of our economic actions are entrepreneurs. Again, I, I gave two examples, but there are so many other ones. Um, for one, uh, 
we want to see cleaner tech. So even, you know, the, the amount of um, lighting, the amount of energy we use to commute, uh, how can we bring that down to a bare minimum or make it more efficient? How can we draw energy from our environment in a way that doesn't affect our environment? Uh, one way of looking at it is greener urban buildings. For example, I mean, lights are always on in high in in hallways and buildings. And I know someone will say, oh, but, you know, lighting doesn't take that much electricity. Okay, yes, but when you look at lighting from around the world um, in these building corridors, uh, that is a significant amount. So you have buildings being built with lead, um, so sensors that turn the lights on and off, for example. Um, Another element is concrete uh, attracts a lot of heat. And so buildings in urban environments get hot and we have rising temperatures. So how are we offsetting this heat? Well, AC is not the answer because that creates a great demand for, for electricity, for unsustainable electricity. Um, and so how are we thinking about cooling these buildings down in the long run? Urban farming has been uh, one response, so building gardens on rooftops, building gardens in balcony, uh, creating mini ecological environments right outside our um, condo doors. Another important one uh, we are seeing and we, we will continue to see is, is as these innovation cycles get smaller and smaller, it becomes easier and easier for people to be left behind. Not everyone has the same access to information that we have and it isn't onus on us to make sure that we are allowing people to stay at pace with the changes of technology in a way that can benefit them as well and um, in a way that can ensure that you know their future populations are adapting just as quickly. Uh, we see a depletion of freshwater sources. Um, water treatment is uh, very expensive and also demands a lot of energy. So how are we uh, treating water, perhaps capturing water more effectively from uh, the world around us? Packaging, oh, packaging is a big one. I mean, I feel um, a guilty conscience every time I throw a one-time use piece of plastic out. And it is incredibly hard to go to the supermarket and not grab a plastic bag to put your apples in. There is no system yet that has made it easier for us even with um, the recyclable bags, yes, that the bags are recycled, but generally when plastic has been recycled once, it becomes harder and harder to recycle it a second and third time. Um, so what type of um, unique packaging or new systems, new ways of thinking are we bringing into the world to say this single use plastic thing has not been working and, and won't work into the future? Ethical AI, so, uh, it's very hard for corporations who um, are at the forefront of AI to slow down because if they slow down and another nation doesn't, um, they've lost that, that race. Uh, so we have to pace up ethical contributions to AI just as fast as AI is moving. And we can do that. Um, we can do that with, with more people dedicated to that um, socially impactful cause uh, through, through their businesses. And how amazing would it be to be leading the race and then also um, leading the ethical considerations of that race as well and, and forming um, that standard. Uh, so I know, for example, there are people working on creating bots that have compassion, creating bots that are a little bit dumber so that when they're working with humans, um, they're a little bit more considerate. Uh, and so, this is just one one example um, in a way to kind of um, slow down the race without slowing it down at the same time. So the research is still happening, but in a way that's conscious. Um, circular economy, going back to eco-friendly packaging. So how can we um, upcycle instead of just recycle, right? How does something get even better after we've already used it? so that it can go back into the market into something that the general population will actually want, not just specific populations who can't afford newer things. A lot of people doing great things in that arena, 
but we don't see um, the greatest, the biggest corporations um, uh, doing it quite timely enough. Um, and so new entrepreneurs can come in and propose these new ideas um, that sometimes become full-fledged companies and scale up. And other times what happens is, you know, the big corporations say, oh, wow, they've, they, they're nimble and they're quick and they've accelerated their idea quite fast. Let's buy into it. Another thing um, that has plagued us one way or another and remains a desire for us all is finding a cure for cancer or an end to cancer overall. Another hot topic is simply saving, you know, one of the hallmarks of our environment, which is the bees, um, saving them and understanding um, their intricate lives in a way um, that can ensure our, uh, our sanity currently. So we're not freaking out about whether enough there'll be enough food and then also ensuring their prosperity along with ours moving into the future. So we see more delicious crops and um, easier, easier food generation. And so to kind of top this off, the, the final strategic outcome from the entrepreneurial strategy is that entrepreneurship is in the best position to promote practical sustainability. And I use the word practical because, again, it's it's the low hanging fruit in which it makes it easier for every consumer to to tag along. There is a, a long list of other methods in which um, social impact and, and entrepreneurship intersect. Um, we don't have time to get into them today, um, but uh, of course there there is so corporate social responsibility for uh, corporations. Um, there is pledging for different businesses. Um, we see social impact making its way to education even more, uh, impact investing, health, which is like at the heart of all society, right? How like health in itself has um, a major bottom line and societal impact. So how how we look at that differently. In wrapping up, um, I wanna say uh, thank you for taking the time to listen to this important topic and uh, with, uh, along with uh, CFAL York, uh, UNITAR and, and York University, um, you can discover uh, new business approaches, uh, new methods that make profit, planet and people an equal bottom line, um, an opportunity to apply SDGs to your everyday life, your organization, um, your even your your role at any company you're in, how to monitor and evaluate the progress of your SDGs, how to apply the theory of change, which is um, kind of another it's it's a framework for grit, but in organizations, um, how to create impact while simultaneously growing profitably, um, and and many more. So uh, CFL York will soon um, do a course announcement, uh, stay posted with us to, to learn about all of these and more. Thank you so much. I think we're gonna open, uh, we're gonna pass on the mics now for questions. Right, yes, Julia? yes, definitely. That was amazing content, Dana. That was, I, I think our audience took away a lot of you know, information from the session and kind of defining the different types of entrepreneurs and the responsibility. I love the social piece and how it ties back to sustainability. Um, and the fact that Canada itself is also, you know, less entrepreneurs. That's something that's very surprising, um, given the fact that we have a lot of uh, new immigrants coming in. And I feel like the innovation comes from the foreign side, where a lot of new immigrants want to come into Canada and start their own business. And that's how they want to establish and kind of have that pride of, you know, made in Canada or having a Canadian um business. So in the chat, I do see a hand raised. So Lillian um, Hassan, would you like to unmute yourself? And Francesco, if you could help us with that. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, thank you for this great session. Very hot uh, topics, very um, needed topics. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I actually have two questions. Um, question number one, the world has rapidly transformed with AI, like we, everybody realized this. So 
becoming uh, AI is becoming a key driver of innovation, empowering entrepreneurs, um, and creating new opportunities across various sectors. Now, my question is. How can the integration of AI as an innovation among entrepreneurs contribute to achieving the SDGs and advancing community development? How can this play, uh, play a role? My second question is uh, related to food banks and sustainable projects. How can we ensure that food banks not only provide immediate relief, but also operate in a truly sustainable manner? Uh, to be honest, and having worked with various NGOs in the Middle East on this initiative, I've observed how these efforts often fall, fall short of sustainability. Like at some place, we need strategies that can be adopted to create rather lasting solutions, not only for food security, of course, but everything else. I, now it's time to go beyond like temporary aid. Like, see what I'm see what I'm trying to say. Um, currently, I'm working on a project in Lebanon to secure food security, but through agriculture, like encouraging uh, families to start uh, planting their own uh, land, like even if if it's close to their houses, and um, because this is more sustainable in, in a sense, more than just giving uh, a temporary relief. Um, and how can we do that in, uh, inspired, inspired from SDGs? Thank you so much. Great questions, great questions. So AI is, is something I'm both passionate and um, a bit informed about. So AI is, is, I mean, possesses so much possibility for the SDGs. And we're already seeing it. So for one, it's creating accessible, affordable technology for regular farmers to have precision agriculture in their farms, for example, right? To be able to identify a pest um, right away and not have to pay tons of money to get rid of the pest and instead working to, um, working to uh, be proactive in their pest control. But I, I just want to say something very important that when the SDGs were first released, what happened was developing nations, so nations that were lower on um, you know, the, the goal uh, pursuits, they took the SDGs first and went running with them. And it was like, oh, okay, you know, because uh, we have all these 17 problems, we need to attack the SDGs first. And I was in, I was, um, in a, a developing nation at that time and I, I saw SDGs being discussed discussed left, right, and center. Um, and then when you come to the States and Canada, because everything looks uh, more polished, everything is more advanced, um, the SDGs were no longer, uh, or I didn't, I didn't find them um, as frequented in the discussion, right? Because we lo are looking to advance technically, we're looking to get ahead of these technical uh, races um, in, in research and development uh, of AI, in, in, in blockchain, um, in cloud computing, and so on, and so robotics, so on and so forth. And so I think that this is why this program um, and the speaker series is so important, because it is putting sustainable development at the heart of economic development in the most developed nations, in the leading nations around the world. Um, and therefore progressing our learning of sustainability in business models uh, much further than, than we ever could. Um, and so, uh, you know, in places where certain environmental factors like politics cannot change, right? Like I remember that, you know, certain places in, in Africa, um, I also volunteer with an NGO in Africa. I mean, they don't even consider the political environment when they're running their business. They cannot, because they know they cannot enact certain policy changes. You know, that, that can't happen. But when we, we live in a country where, you know, you have a say um, in, in the democracy of what type of changes you want to see, well, then sustainability model testing, sustainability model evolution becomes even more important because it leads that research and, um, and then impacts the entire world as a result. So I just want to say that um, sustainability is at the heart of AI and should go hand in hand with AI. And uh, it is already being done, but I think it should be practiced even more 
um, where we are right now and it being seen as a low hanging fruit so that we can draw from that knowledge, put that in the open data charter and allow um, other countries to, to benefit from it as well. Um, and then as for uh, you know what you mentioned, these sustainability models, as you can see here, I'm showing you a business model canvas and a social business model canvas. So traditionally we, we, we built the business model canvas. Um, uh, in this business model canvas, we don't see, okay, Dr. Ali is headed out. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Glad you enjoyed it. So we see that uh, the, we only look at cost and revenue. That's it. But in the evolution of the business model canvas to a social business model canvas, we are seeing the cost to the environment, the cost to our society, the benefit to our society, and the benefit to our environment. This has not evolved enough. We still don't, I mean, at the heart of our conversations in business is still maximize shareholder value, right? It is not to maximize shareholder value and maximize benefit to our planet and societies. This is still evolving. And I think business models are continuing to evolve. And the, given the fast rate of technological evolution right now, um, we need to be able to allow these business models to evolve just as fast and to keep up with that change to say, here is a business model that works. Here is a multi-billion dollar business that has multi-billion dollar benefit to our environment. And you know what? I, I knew I wouldn't have time, but I, I put an example here. Um, one of my favorite fellas, uh, Yvonne, uh, he is the founder of Patagonia. Okay, so Patagonia, he, he's a rock climber. He's a nature enthusiast. Um, he founded Patagonia. Uh, he was originally looking for ways in which you can rock climb without damaging the rock. Like, this is how amazing this guy is. So when you rock climb, you often have to pierce something into the rock and then climb it. Um, don't know all the details, not an expert, but he wanted more effective ways to do it. So he, he uh, founded Patagonia. Uh, it's like an outfitting company and they have um, a lot of clothes for nature. Anyways, um, come 2021 and he says, all my shares are going to planet earth. That is a, that is a key element of my environment, of my environment, my economic environment. And so he has set a standard and a benchmark for how he's looking at business models saying, what if we gave 20% of our shareholding to the planet and gauged how that 20% is, uh, satisfied to understand how the planet is satisfied or unsatisfied, to understand how our business will move into the future, right? Because that's what companies care about. Are their shareholders satisfied? And if not, well, what do they need to change in the business? What if we made the planet a part of our shareholder? So a part of our shareholding. So th these are just some ways that we are testing and we need more and more testing to happen in business model development to be able um, to, to find, to find the, all the answers. But great work, great work what you're doing. I do agree, uh, self-sustenance is one of the ways into the future. And actually AI is proving that we all need to be entrepreneurs. We all need to be agents of change because as things move faster and faster, you are going to be responsible for your own direction. You can no longer go into, we're seeing, we're seeing billion dollar businesses with one employee. That is unprecedented, which means that you need to be the in control of, of your future and of your economic outcomes moving into the future to, understand um, how you can keep up with the case, how you can adapt, because there's nobody that's going to coddle you and nurture you anymore when they can have a billion dollar business on their own, right? So just something to consider, something to empower yourself with. We are all agents of change. And this, um, this change making needs to grow exponentially into the future within us. Dana, thank you so much for Lillian for that wonderful question and thought provoking. Um, and also for Dana for answering that question in such a wonderful way about different projects that are taking place. So Dana, I had a question of my own. Um, so for the audience, you had just mentioned agents of change and we all should be a part of this um, sustainability and looking at SDGs. So I wanted to know like, what are your three takeaways for our audience today on the topic of entrepreneurship? So the, the three takeaways is always keep the three sustainable development pillars in mind. Yes. Make them at the heart of all the outcomes that you aim to do. So people, um, profit, economy, and planet. Um, the second one is 
um, unleash that entrepreneur within. There's a big discussion that you can't create entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. I think you can nurture them. I think we yes. all have a seed within us um, in which uh, there, there is an agent of change, something that goes back to grit, something that we are so interested in and that we have the willingness to give an unlimited amount of practice to nurture that. It's going to be uh, even more uh, critical going into the future and take part in community, be a part of those um, the exchanges that happen, foster your network capital as best as you can. That is a key element of the entrepreneurial strategy and our economy. Yes. And then also my other question that I had in, in mind was, you know, for entrepreneurship, what do you think is like the upcoming trends? What will you see for entrepreneurship and the way it's going? Well, I hope not more entrepreneurs moving to the States. Yes. <laughs> I hope mm -hmm. not that. Um, what I hope is uh, for more diversity and inclusion in the teams that we're seeing. Yeah. So more unique perspectives can arise because science shows that with diversity, uh, we are we can get to solutions even faster. Uh, so we are seeing that. Um, we're seeing diverse teams come together. We are seeing uh, uh, conscious consumerisms paving the way for what they demand from their companies, um, therefore making it more important. And, and they're becoming aware too. They're becoming aware yeah. that there's greenwashing and there's <laughs> real environmental impact, right? Um, so uh, these conscious consumers are uh, going to, to begin demanding more moving into the future. Um, and so seeing a, a greater, greater, uh, not just marketing, but inherent change um, in the way that uh, we we use products, um, we leverage re services uh, moving into the future is, is a major trend. And of course, tech, digital yes. transformation. Um, it is out with the old and with the new. And so in one way or another, um, leverage the leverage technology as a tool around you in making your ease, your work more productive. And that's another key element of our economy is our pro productivity capital, right? Um, how can you make what you do um, uh, smarter, not necessarily faster or greater, but smarter? Yes, and just uh, for the last question I have is, how can people contact you if they want to learn more yes. and ask any questions? Sure. So. I am available here. Yes, I even have my number. Feel free to reach yes. out to me, WhatsApp or Messenger. I mean, I'm always up for, for discussing. And this is a really great opportunity uh, for me to be speaking uh, with CFL York. Um, so thank you. And I'm very happy to, to continue the conversation. Yes. And everyone, thank you so much for your participation today and for coming out to join us on this conversation. I'm pretty sure we'll have many more sessions to come. So check out the Seafall York work, uh, page and then also our YouTube channel to make sure that you can get your notes in <laughs> for any things that you missed for Dana. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next session. Have a wonderful Julia. day. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to quickly also say thank you to you, Elia, for moderating the session. Thank you, Dana, for that great presentation. Um, thank you both as well for helping to organize the series. Um, and thank you to everybody in the audience for taking the time to be here and for interacting. Um, I hope you've taken away a lot from this um, from this session and the series as a whole. Um, just to follow up on Elia's my last comment there, I have shared our social medias and our YouTube link in the chat. Uh, if you would like to um, stay up to date with everything that we're doing and uh, visit, revisit some of the, the sessions that we've had, um, you'll find everything there. Um, and as Dana mentioned at the end of her session, we'll also be officially announcing uh, our Sustainable Economic Development course um, in the coming weeks. So also please stay tuned for, um, for that as well. Um, and with that, just one last big thank you to everybody. That uh, was a great session. So, um, yeah, I hope everybody's learned as much as I did. Um, and, uh, yeah, well, uh, just as one last final reminder as well, it is a monthly series. So our next session will be October 9th. So also please stay tuned for that and like that on your calendar. Share the website, share um, the social media posts if you see them um, with your networks. Our registration for this series and all of our series is always open and free for everybody. Um, so with that, yeah, just one final thank you, and I hope everybody has a great day.